Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. I greet you with the greeting of the prophets. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. My name is Zahir Idris. I'm the president of the Muslim Legal Network of New South Wales. I take this opportunity to recognise the traditional owners of the land and their elders, both past and present, and being the Wangal and Watagoro clans of the Auburn Homebush area. Honourable Brad Hazard, Attorney General of New South Wales, Honourable Paul Lynch, Justice Gagler of the High Court of Australia, Chief Justice Bathurst of the Supreme Court of New South Wales, President Beasley of the Court of Appeal, Justices and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court, Justices of the Family Court, <coughs> Justices of the Federal Court, Justices of the District Court, Magistrates of the Local Court, Commissioners of the Industrial Relations Commission, Distinguished Guests, Colleagues, Friends and Family. On behalf of Dr. Abdurrahman Asaroglu of the Auburn Mosque Committee and on behalf of the Muslim Legal Network, I welcome you to the 2015 Islamic Opening of Law Term Service. As we gather in only the fourth Islamic Opening of Law Term Service in the country and celebrating the centenary of the Anzac landing, it is fortuitous that we are gathered in the Gallipoli Mosque, which is named in honour of the connection between Turkey and Australia and the close bond the nations have enjoyed since its difficult beginnings 100 years ago. This mosque has served to build bridges between Muslims and wider community since its opening and, continue, and continues to do so. In a similar way, we, as a profession, gather at this venue and other religious services during the early part of the year to seek guidance and blessings for the coming year in a hope to build understanding and mutual education between the various communities, the judiciary and the legal fraternity as a whole. And again, take this chance to thank you all for your attendance. As is custom in our faith, we will start the program with a recitation of the Quran. Thereafter, our keynote speech by Imam Afroz, Imam Afroz Ali, <coughs> and ending with a short prayer.
Imam Afroz Ali is the founder and president of Al Ghazali Centre for Islamic Sciences and Human Development based in Sydney. Uh, Imam Afroz has also been a great supporter of our organisation since its inception and we thank him for taking the time to speak today on the topic of justice and ethics in Islam. Imam Afroz. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge the, the uh, traditional custodians of the land that we are uh, blessed to find ourselves in. I also want to acknowledge the uh, members of the uh, jury from various uh, departments. Uh, I'm for the f one of those rare times, in fact, uh, shaking at my knees. I'm not quite sure if it's from the fear of the barristers and jurists and justices and judges or from the hope of God Almighty's house that I'm standing in. I'm hoping it's the latter in this regard. I also want to uh, acknowledge the Muslim Legal Network uh, for honoring me to speak here briefly on the uh, topic of uh, justice by being unjust to me in giving me only 10 to 12 minutes to speak on such a de deep topic in relation to justice. Uh, I think uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the scholars uh, from various uh, theological uh, groups here, particularly Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Jazakumullah uh, Khairan, thank you very much for allowing me to speak over here. I think the topic of justice is uh, quite a not only broad, it's, a, it's an immense ocean to in fact deal with. And I, I mention it as an immense ocean because one of the aspects of Islamic aspects of ethics, law and justice is that there are terms which probably need to be defined and I want to spend more time in terms uh, in hope to allow people to reflect through these as to how we have points of commonality in relation to the, the common law in, as we would uh, uh, pr practice here in the statutory laws in Australia as well as the theological based laws that we actually have in Islam and we will leave it to another day as to who contributed most to the current modern laws that we actually have in front of us. There is a term uh, which we would refer to as maxims uh, and principles as, as referred to as qawaid in, in Arabic but it also has another term, another meaning to this term in which qi'ada is an ocean. And therefore, we see that the, 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 the Qur'an, the primary source of our uh, legal uh, uh, jurisdiction, actually has an incredible amount of explicit, uh, uh, technical and very pragmatic and in sometimes very dry legal uh, statements. However, behind all of that, we see an incredible amount of principles and frameworks that in fact are present and I really wanted to in fact speak about that. And in this regard, uh, justice is a significant element. Uh, and so let's look at justice as a definition. The Arabic word for justice is, is Adal and it's one of the attributal names of God Almighty as Al-Adal. Interestingly that he is called Al-Adal because essentially the meaning is that he is justice that God Almighty is justice, that he is not just just, that in fact he is who is the owner of justice in that regard. So a question arises in relation to the role of the human being in terms of justice, which I will touch uh, a little later on. Firstly, in relation to the term uh, Adel, the, the person, or sorry, not the person, but the weight that is put onto a camel in order to balance it, 
that act in getting it balanced so that the camel can travel in a balanced manner. This particular act is called udul. So adal in its, in its original form refers to the ability to have a nuanced balancing. That justice is about nuanced balancing of a number of competing elements that I'm sure you all are aware of and the complexity all of that. But this nuanced balancing is also connected to another element because the person who does that, the person who achieves udul on a camel is called a hikam. So a hikam, the common word that we're used to that comes from the, the letters ha, ka and meme is hikmah which is about wisdom. So hikam is the person who achieves this balance by putting things in the right places. And therefore, wisdom is about the ability to place things in their right places. And the judge is called a hakim because his role is to look at the various competing elements in order to come to a conclusion, hopefully by measuring, analyzing, and coming to conclusions by putting things in their right places. This aspect of adl as justice and the aspect of Hikmah, wisdom, our work, uh, work together, which I'm going to return to briefly in a few minutes. I wanted to mention that in Islam, when we, when we listen to some of the verses that actually have been so beautifully translated, often sounds like that we speak of a retributive justice. But this is not the case in Islam. In fact, Islam's justice is always enveloped, always embraced, always engulfed, with the concept of compassion. That in fact, true justice cannot be achieved if compassion is not the overriding factor. And again, which I will return to something a bit later on. In this regard, we have two principles of Islam by which justice and compassion work together, hopefully, to attain. Firstly, for the human consciousness to know al-adl, to know the one who gives us justice, which is, in Islamic terms, we would refer to tawheed, or this returning everything to none other than God. But that's a theological point because the two principles divide humanity or hum humanity's actions, one into a theological world that if you do so and if you believe so, it makes you a Muslim. But the second, which is called Jalb al-Masalih, which is the accrual of benefit, is applicable to all human beings and an advocacy to all human beings to in fact engage in in order to bring about benefit. So compassion and justice, their aims are to bring about benefit from all humanity. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Socratic and the Platonic world of virtues. Islam is not any different in that regard. And I might add that in fact, Islam's understanding of the four virtues come very independently from the Platonic idea of virtues. It just happens to be the five or the four virtues come congruently together when later on these things were um, uh, um, reconciled in this regard. So for example, one of the first scholars, uh, uh, Imam al-Muhasibi, who had no access to the works of Platon, uh, uh, Plato's work in relation to virtues, actually mentions these four virtues. And I wanted to mention them because they form the part of the ocean in relation to the principles of justice. That justice arises from these three other elements of, uh, of what we would refer to as super virtues. The first is that in order for justice to occur, wisdom must be present, as we have mentioned already. And in order for wisdom, which is the second virtue, for wisdom to be present, we do need to temper our ability in order to measure the various uh, 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 elements that provide us the complexity in trying to actually be just with in our decision making. And remembering here that justice is not only to the external, to the other, but also to ourselves, because we can only really be just to others if we are just to ourselves. And some of these more spiritual discussions hopefully can be held elsewhere. And in this regard, we have the virtue of temperance or iffa in, in Arabic. So you have the aspect of justice attained through wisdom and number three being uh, temperance. But fourth, which is, in my opinion, 
seriously lacking in the world today, and that means all of us, and that is, the Arabic term for that is shuja'a, which is courage, to be able to stand for the truth, even if it is against ourselves. That it is not so much about right or wrong that we are therefore part of it, but in fact that we are people who want to transcend and only hold on to the truth of what is right and what is beneficial and what is just. And when these three things come together, we in fact experience justice. I know I don't have much time over here, so I want to end by looking at uh, uh, one of the great theologians and, and, and philosophers, although he probably would turn in his graves for me to say that he was a philosopher, and that was my favorite scholar, Imam Ghazali, who obviously I'm sure you all know, wrote the book, uh, The Incoherence of Philosophers, uh, also, interestingly becomes one of the most important books in philosophy. He actually mentions three particular concepts in relation to justice and law, and that the law is the tool by which the ethics of justice is achieved, seen through the morality of people. And he talks about these three things, and I'm slightly nuancing this. And I want to end my talk, my brief sharing over here, to challenge you as people who practice uh, 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 law in this country. And I want to uh, thank each and every one of you for taking the burden of responsibility to keep things as orderly as possible in this nation, which is a great nation. And we all have a collective responsibility to keep it safe and to keep it a place where it is a well-being for each and every one of us. Uh, I, um, many years ago, as, a, as an architect, now as a former architect, uh, used to uh, be an expert witness in, in the Land and Environment Court. And I know most of you standing over here probably laugh at me and go, that's not a court. <laughs> but I did get a window of an experience of what it, it is like to be uh, in the forefront of trying to be just with what we have in front of us. So Imam Ghazali talked about these three things, and as I said, I'm nuancing this to ask you to reflect on these three things in relation to three, I consider to be three major elements of, the, of ethics that law needs to address. The first is the environment. Should our laws be directed towards controlling emissions or planning sustainability. Islam's framework and principles would say it would be the latter, that we ought to have laws that plan sustainability rather than the next elections. Secondly, health. Should we manage disease should we have disease control or should we have a development of nurturing well-being for everybody? Islam would say that we need to aspire for the second. And thirdly and lastly, should our social governance, should our laws affecting the civil citizens be about a retributive and punitive justice? Or should it be driven by compassionate justice? These are the questions I believe that in the evolution of law, in raising human standards to a higher ethics, is a question that you have to answer over and beyond your daily work that you do. And I pray to God Almighty that you have the openings, that you have the success, and you have the facilitation to maintain order, justice, safety, well-being, and goodness for each and every one of us here in Australia. Thank you very much.